Good morning and a warm welcome to the Latrobe Financial Investor Update Call for September. I'm Bridget Crow, Head of Corporate Affairs at Latrobe Financial. Thank you for joining us. During today's presentation, your lines will be in listen only mode. I'd also like to remind you that the webinar will be recorded. We've had a number of questions sent to us ahead of time and we'll try to address these questions throughout the presentation in the relevant places. We'll also take questions at the end of the presentation, if time permits. To submit questions at any time during the presentation, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please note that we won't be able to speak to individual account questions in this forum, but our investor team is always available to take your calls and questions on 1800 818 818. I'll now hand over to our Chief Investment Officer, Chris Andrews. update. Terrific to have you with us. Our discussion last month was focused on the impact that the phase two lockdown of Victoria would have on Australia's economic rebound from hibernation. This month we have additional data on this and of course we're learning more, we're getting more data points as each day goes by. Fundamentally however our assessment remains unchanged. Australia and indeed the world, we're on a very, very bumpy road to recovery. We're likely to see lower economic growth, we're likely to see lower unemployment and we're likely to see lower interest rates for an extended period. We'll probably also see further setbacks before the journey is done, so let's be realistic about this. Despite all of that, the big picture is that our national economy and indeed our global economy is continuing to trend back towards what we're describing as a new COVID normal. As we'll discuss in a little while, our domestic economy is substantially better positioned than it was just a few short months ago in March and April, Feel, remember those times. And it's certainly far better placed than most developed economies around the world, at least thus far. So today we'll be discussing these themes and their impact on Latrobe Financial's business and credit fund portfolios. We'll also welcome back to our webinar, our Chief Financial Officer, Martin Barry. Martin will give an overview of Latrobe Financial's results for the 2020 financial year. But of course, noting that some of you are joining us for the first time and a big special welcome to all of you, let's start with a quick overview of Latrobe Financial's business. Since 1952, Latrobe Financial has been recognised as Australia's leading credit specialist wealth manager. Our total addressable market is $2.5 trillion in size. So that's the total of the $1.9 trillion residential mortgage market and the $650 billion commercial mortgage market. That is, to be absolutely clear, a third again larger than the $1.9 trillion Australian Stock Exchange. It's an incredibly broad and deep market that we operate in, and it's a market that presents rich opportunities for high quality execution for our investors and through our investment strategies. We have 11 billion in assets under management for investors ranging from the largest global institutions to the biggest banks in Australia, to family offices, fund managers, and 47,000 everyday investors in our credit fund. These relationships provide real-time insight into global and domestic markets, and they augment the data that we're receiving from the $11.4 billion in investment grade assets that we're originating annually. We are a portfolio company of the US-based Blackstone Group who have over 564 billion in assets under management globally. Now, Blackstone have really deep expertise in credit and property, and they have a relentless focus on investment discipline that is very complementary to our own. So at a corporate level, we're very well placed. We've built a really deep reservoir of trust with our investors, and we have genuine conviction in the resilience of our strategies to periods of market turmoil. Importantly, the leadership team are co-investors in the credit fund with over $125 million invested. Our leadership team bats very deep in, indeed. Our 140 strong real estate credit division is headed by industry veteran Corey Bannister, our chief lending officer, supported by deputy CLO David Blakely, the former chief risk officer of ANZ North America. 
Corey and David lead a host of industry veterans like Ron Dunbar, a 30 year industry veteran and ex Challenger National Credit Manager, the multi award winning Michelle Bannister with 23 years at Latrobe Financial and deep credit expertise, Jason Mears with three decades experience, including as former MD of corporate banking at ANZ Bank, and Mark Hood with two decades in credit, including in senior credit roles at ANZ. In our private wealth division, we have Deputy CIO Troy Stratton with two decades of experience globally at Barclays Bank and HSBC, alongside Annie Sestito, ex Westpac and George and ME Bank, and Gary Bell, the former head of liquidity risk at the National Australia Bank, including through the global financial crisis. A key member of our risk team is Rick Drury, former head of the NAB's workout and turnaround area and the NAB's UK commercial property operations. Rick works with industry veteran Sean Wright and Jackie Giuliani, a two decade veteran of collections and workout with degrees in laws, law and finance. These executives lead the teams dealing with borrowers experiencing hardship and arrears events. And as you've heard over the pre over previous months, they have been doing an incredible job in their portfolio. Overall, this is a high caliber team, broad experience and with very deep expertise and skills. We will continue to augment it as the business grows. Our asset quality has improved measurably as our business has grown in recent years. So that's reflective of our broader market footprint and the active management of our credit analysts and portfolio managers who do have tremendous discipline around investment execution. It's also been assisted by the contraction of the credit appetites of the banks in the wake of Baal III, global banking standards, uh, macro prudential regulation, and of course, uh, most prominently, the Hain Royal Commission. The chart on screen shows that in June 2016, prime and super prime assets were 28.2% of the Latrobe financial portfolio. Four years later, that's grown to 38%, up 32%. Similarly, the higher returning but riskier specialist assets were 19.1% of our portfolio in 2016. They are now just 9%, a 50% reduction. As you'd expect, we're taking particular care to ensure high quality assets in the current environment. We have been really pleased to confirm that the three year partnership between Latrobe Financial and Qantas Frequent Flyer has been a tremendous success in its first month of operation. This partnership aims to provide even more value for investors in the Latrobe Australian Credit Fund and to help your money work even harder than it already does. Under the partnership, New eligible investments of $10,000 or more into the 12 month term account are receiving 250 Qantas points for every $1,000 invested. For more information, please call us or head to our website at latrobefinancial.com. On that note, let me hand over to our Chief Financial Officer, Martin Barry. Martin's well known to you, having presented at these webinars previously. He's an actuary and career banker, having worked in London, Tokyo and Sydney, where he heads up our Sydney office now. He's chairman of our Assets and Liabilities Committee and he's highly respected in debt capital markets. Martin, thanks for joining us on the back of closing another tremendous debt capital market issuance for the group. It's been another strong year for the Latrobe Financial Group, despite market volatility. Over to you, Martin. Thank you, Chris, and good morning, everybody. It's my great pleasure to talk to you today about the annual results for Latrobe Financial Group as at 30 June this year. These results were signed off at our annual general meeting last Friday by the board of Latrobe Financial. And the results have been audited by KPMG, a globally leading accountancy firm. And I may add, we have a very clean, a completely clean audit opinion for the group. So, pleasing result there and lots of activity in the last few months to finalize those results. Turning to the slide uh, on the screen at the moment, I'll start with the top section, the volume and activity for the last financial year ending 30 June. So we originated some $11.4 billion of mortgage loans, and that resulted in group settlements of $5.7 billion, a net increase of $3 billion year on year. That drove revenues in the group $657.3 million, uh, and that was a pleasing result. Importantly, the loan to value ratio for assets within the credit fund was stable year on year at 63%, as was the average borrower credit score at 860 points. 
So certainly we feel at Latrobe Financial that we captured the growth opportunity that presented in the last financial year that delivered very attractive assets for Latrobe Financial and for investors. And we feel that the outlook uh, is, is really positive as well, um, that we have an opportunity in front of us as uh, the major banks deal with the fallout from the Royal Commission uh, and the various class action and remediation processes. So certainly we feel, as Chris mentioned, there's a very large market for us to play in and that we can deliver those opportunities to investors in the forward financial year. Looking in the middle of the screen at the moment, our funding profile over the last financial year, we tilted to cash, as we've mentioned on some of these previous calls. We had $1.1 billion of undrawn funding at 30 June, and we added another $400 million to that in August. And that gives us a total of in excess of $3 billion of institutional funding facilities. So we have lots of liquidity available within the Latrobe Financial Group. Over the last financial year, we issued $2.5 billion of residential mortgage-backed securities, RMBS bonds, to global investors. That was an increase of 67% year on year. And as Chris mentioned earlier, we just announced yesterday a $500 million placement into the global capital markets. So really pleasing that those markets are open and available to the Latrobe Financial Group. The credit fund finished the financial year at $4.8 billion, up some 40% year on year. We're really pleased with that growth and pleased to welcome those new and additional investors into the Latrobe Financial Group. Our free cash at 30 June was $55 million and as at the end of August, $72 million. So we certainly feel that we have ample liquidity, ample free cash and capital available in the group and that uh, assists us in creating what we call a fortress balance sheet, a balance sheet that will be able to survive various stresses over time and uh, really deliver uh, a conservative outcome for investors and the broader Latrobe Financial Group. Looking at our business operations in the bottom half of the page, our cost to income ratio stable year on year. We had some 68,000 investors as at 30 June, so really pleasing to have uh, customers at the end of June, really pleasing to have those customer numbers in the business. And our staff on just under 400, 377 as at the end of June, and we've put on some new staff since then as well. Importantly, we didn't lose any working days through the coronavirus period. All of our work from home procedures uh, have, have been executed flawlessly. Um, and importantly, all of our operational staff are here in Australia. So we've experienced no delays from offshore mortgage processing. All of our operational staff are based here in Australia. Next slide, please. Turning to our earnings at the top of the page here, um, some $11 billion of assets under management. And as we saw over the, the last financial year, interest rates dropped dramatically in March. And we saw BBSW drop uh, to some uh, 109 basis points over the year. And the combination of that $11 billion of assets under management and the decline in interest rates uh, really benefited the group and, and drove our strong group revenue at $657 million for the financial year. The credit fund is a major contributor to those revenue, revenues, just under 50% uh, of our group revenue. Turning to the middle section, arrears and impairments over the year. Arrears were up 3.3% uh, 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 over the year. And that's very manageable for the group. It's certainly within historical boundaries. And we'll keep a close watching brief on those arrears and hardship numbers over the forward period. Importantly, we took a conservative approach and uh, overlaid a COVID provision on top of our standard uh, collective and specific provisions. So added some uh, additional 20 basis points of, of COVID overlay to our provisions, taking group total provisions to 51 basis points. So really uh, a, a strong uh, provision there, if you like, uh, for uh, the forward period, and certainly at the upper end of our peer group uh, as we compare that with the broader marketplace. 
Specific bad and doubtful debt charges remain low and very manageable, five and 10 basis points uh, across the various funding segments of the business. Turning to capital at the end of the financial year, we had $420 million of shock absorber and regulatory capital at the end of the financial year, plus the free cash that we had on the balance sheet. So ended the year with $475 million of group capital, just under half a billion dollars. And that will increase over the forward period as we build that fortress balance sheet. I may draw your attention to the reinvestment of those uh, uh, that capital and profits within the group. We reinvested 71% of profits over the last financial year. So certainly we're prepared to support the business and to uh, create that fortress balance sheet, as I mentioned earlier. The bottom section of the slide here, investor distributions for the last financial year, $211.2 million, a really pleasing result, up 31% year on year. That's genuine wealth creation within the Australian economy, and we're very pleased to deliver that to end investors. We ended the year with $405 million of cash within the credit fund available to support any contingencies or stresses that the credit fund may experience, and $4.2 billion of mortgage investments with tenor increasing by 397 days. So, really pleasing uh, end of financial year position for the credit fund. Next slide, please. I may just wrap up uh, the group annual results presentation to put into context Latrobe Financial's contribution to the broader Australian economy. Since 1952, we have lent $28.5 billion into uh, the Australian mortgage market. And the International Monetary Fund estimates that this has a multiplier effect of 2.8 times. So Latrobe Financial lending to someone to purchase a property, they may decide to uh, release some of the equity in their property and start a new business. And that has a multiplier effect through the economy. That $28.5 billion has led to some $80 billion on the multiplier basis of contribution to Australian gross domestic product. That's estimated to have created 57,000 jobs since 1952. So certainly we believe that we're supporting the broader community, that our contribution is valuable and has a real tangible effect in the broader economy. So certainly, uh, we're, as I say, pleased to, to be open and, and creating that sort of opportunity in, in a broader context. Chris, that's all from me. Back to you. Thank you, Martin, and what a tremendous uh, a tremendous story there. The, the the human story behind these numbers is, of course, the ongoing contribution that we make to the lives and to the families uh, who invest with us, who borrow from us, and that's job creation and the provision of capital to so many individuals and businesses around the country. So, on that note, and thank you again to Martin, we turn to our portfolio update. So our portfolio update, of course, is available on our website now, uh, our monthly portfolio update. We're very proud of it. We do a lot of work to provide really strong transparency from our investors. So our August end of month portfolio update is on our website now. We do encourage investors to read it regularly. It does show how our portfolios are positioned to flourish through the coronavirus period. All of our portfolios are built around the same bottom-up fundamental credit analysis disciplines with active management from our portfolio team. Now, seven decades in markets has taught us that the five C's credit assessment model delivers the highest standards of discipline and diligence. It applies to every single loan that we write in our group. It applies to all of our portfolios and it ensures that we retain the highest standards of asset selection, which is obviously what all of our investors, whether the largest institutions or everyday investors in the credit fund, expect of us. The single most critical success metric for our fund, of course, is our long-term income profile. So the graphs on your screen shows the performance of $100,000 invested in October 2002, which is the inception date of the 12 month term account across a range of asset classes. The dark blue line is cash, green is property securities, light blue is bonds, red is global shares, gray is Australian shares. 
The purple line is our classic notice account. And the thick orange line up the middle of the page is the 12 month term account, which of course started in October 2002, as I said. The returns that it's delivered over that period have been very strong, even in absolute, even in absolute terms over the entire period of the 12 month term accounts strategy. Its performance is also incredibly consistent or low in volatility. It simply keeps on performing month in and month out. That's why it presents that gently upward shaped curve rather than the ups and downs of other asset classes. Now that's important for investors. It's important because it takes the question of the timing of an investment off the table. And timing can make a real difference in, uh, in investment outcomes across asset classes. If you invested in Australian shares in 2007, for example, you immediately incurred substantial capital losses. You lost half of your portfolio as the global financial crisis hit. And in fact, in capital terms, your portfolio is still down about 15% even today, 13 years later. That's what economists mean by the long run. By contrast, in our classic account, in our 90 day account, 12 month and four year accounts, we have continued to deliver a flawless track record of returns. None of those accounts has ever lost a cent of investor capital. None has missed a distribution. What's more, none of them has ever failed to pay an investor redemption at maturity. That in a nutshell is the performance profile that we're trying to deliver for investors. The asset quality dashboard you can see on screen is a selection of key metrics from our monthly portfolio report. And it really goes to the quality of the assets in your portfolio. It is just a selection. There are, there are, plenty, uh, there are plenty of additional data points available to you in our monthly portfolio report. You can see our portfolio average loan to value ratios around 63% across the fund. And as Martin said, very stable across time. We take a conservative view on loan to value ratios simply because we know the property values go up and go down. They're less volatile than equities markets. That's absolutely true and verifiable from a, a very quick test of the record. But we do want in all of our portfolios a very significant margin for safety. We like diversified uh, portfolios. We like granular investments, as you can see from the average investment size on screen, just $530,000, for example, in our $3.4 billion 12 month term account portfolio. Experience shows us again that small investments are much, much more ro robust and resilient to market volatility. We do require our borrowers to be of very high quality. And you can see that from the key credit, credit metrics that I've extracted uh, and are on screen. 90% plus of the borrowers in our portfolios have zero credit events in their history. Now I'll speak more about that in a moment. 91% of the portfolio is in metropolitan locations, which avoids the volatility that can be seen in more remote geographies. And we avoid uh, is significant exposures to inner city high rise apartments, for example. We have a measured mix of sectoral exposures and that adds some real ballast and diversity to our portfolios. Turning back to the quality of our borrowers, for every borrower applicant we get through the door, we obtain a credit history report from the independent credit bureau Equifax. The data on screen, screen from Equifax summarises the credit scores of Latrobe financial borrower applicants updated to the end of June 2020. So let me make three points here. Firstly, our borrowers are objectively a very high quality cohort. You can see that from the column graph on the top right hand side of your screen. That dynamic is very supportive, uh, supportive of resilient portfolio performance. As Martin said, average credit score of 860, which is excellent on Equifax's credit rating uh, analysis. Further, the credit quality of our applicants is visibly improving over time. And that's, you can, you can see that from the rise in the red line on the top left, sorry, the blue line on the top left hand side of the graph. This is of course confirmation of my earlier observations about the ongoing improvement that we've been seeing in our portfolios uh, in terms of borrower credit quality. Finally, the credit quality of our applicants is mere, materially above the peer average. Now, that's perhaps not so surprising to the market, given our reputation for conservatism in our lending program. And that, of course, as we've discussed before, is hardwired into our credit assessment and portfolio management selection processes. 
Our portfolios are subject to independent review by Australia's leading independent fund ratings agencies. So that for investors obviously is an important validation of our portfolio decisioning and also our portfolio construction methodologies and disciplines. Across each of these agencies, we hold the highest ratings in the sector for our various offerings. You can see all key ratings on screen, all are available on our website. All of that, of course, has result, resulted in a host of global and domestic awards for excellence in our asset class. And for us, that's confirmation that we continue to lead the industry in the disciplines with which we select our assets and build our portfolios for investors. We're not complacent about that fact. That is absolutely critical to us that we continue to drive increasing quality, increasing expertise into all of our portfolio construction. We bring a very strong and disciplined focus to the issue of liquidity management. Now, those of you who have attended these updates previously, you'll be well aware that we took our short dated accounts really to very overweight cash positions while markets were volatile through March and into April and then, and then even through May when things were settling down a bit. Our classic notice account, in fact, was holding close to 90% cash through that period. Now, consistent with the guidance that we've been providing through these webinars uh, over the last few months, we have commenced a very measured reinvestment program in those accounts, but we are still sitting with cash holdings in our classic account of greater than 47% at the end of August. We are going to continue our watching brief on this issue and will not relax our vigilance. Our preference, of course, is to continue to tilt towards reinvestment, but to do so in a very steady and measured way. Diversification remains a key risk mitigant in all that we do when we put our portfolios together. So you can see that unrivaled diversification we drive into our portfolios. We do that by number of loans. We do that by average investment size, by largest investment, by sector as we've seen previously, and also by ge geography as the donut charts on screen show you. Zenith Investment Partners in fact describe the 12 month term account as the most diversified portfolio in the sector. And that's frankly what we're trying to deliver for all of our investors. We believe that diversification is, is, is really the one free lunch in investment. And we are absolutely determined to continue to drive the highest levels of diversification into all of our portfolios. Turning to hardship. And our experience with borrowers on hardship arrangements has quite frankly exceeded our expectations and in a materially positive way. From peak coronavirus panic in March, many borrowers very rationally applied for hardship relief to preserve their cash flows. Now this drew on standard and pre-existing processes that every lender has at their disposal, but in unprecedented numbers. The really pleasing thing about this, of course, is how quickly those borrower cohorts have returned to standard repayment arrangements. From an April-May peak of around 15% of assets under management, hardship loans have declined now to around 4.9% of fund loans at the end of August. We've seen very new, few new hardship claims, although we are unsurprisingly, we are seeing some of our Victorian borrowers seeking extensions, and we're working through those on a case-by-case -case basis. Projecting forward, we're anticipating that the very significant decline in hardship accounts is going to slow down as the remaining hardship borrowers return to repayments over the next three to six months. Obviously, we're being very sensitive to the unique circumstances our borrowers are experiencing, but our priority does remain on proper management of investor capital. Our guidance that we've been giving you know, from since March and April, May this year, um, has been that it, would, it appears that there will be about a two to three percentage point transition from hardship arrears and, and, and of hardship to arrears. And this still seems appropriate. Uh, we, and we should start to see that play out over the next month or so. The composition of our hardship loans, well, this experience is being felt pretty consistently across the fund and each of its investment accounts at present. The composition of our hardship loans is broadly in line with our overall portfolio, subject to a slight over-indexing to Victoria, as you would expect, but by occupancy type, by repayment type, by security property location, all of that is broadly in line with our overall portfolio. Hardship rates and borrower composition are very consistent across the, uh, across the market. On the left-hand side of the screen, though, you can see that the hardship levels in our accounts are actually outperforming those of other, uh, of other lenders. Now, now, you should note that the data prints that we're getting from other lenders are very dependent on the report date. Very few lenders seem to be 
rushing to monthly reporting as we've done. However, it does seem that our portfolios have recovered ahead of the industry. And that's, that's perhaps reflective of our more mature borrower profile. And two, um, you know, to be fair, to the very active management approach that we've been taking with our hardship borrowers. Nevertheless, it is clear that most operators across the market are reporting declining hardship levels month on month. That's obviously very positive for systemic stability. The split by industry sectors that you can see on the right hand side of the screen is what you'd expect. Hardship continues to be concentrated in the industries most affected by the shutdowns, food and accommodation, uh, retail, uh, and so on. Other industries, including economically important construction industry, have been more resilient thus far. And that's been a tailwind for our portfolios, but it does have some macro consequences for our youth that we'll discuss in a few moments in our headwinds and tailwinds report. We do have, as, as we have done over the last six months or so, we do have our portfolio managers continually testing our collateral position through portfolio loan to value ratio positions and, and, and testing those against these hardship claims. On screen, you can see our end of August results for the flagship 12 month term account as our measure. You can see two things here. First, at the top, hardship levels have followed those of the overall credit fund and we have seen them reduce very quickly in the last few months. The second thing you'll note is that our low loan to value ratios are very resilient. They position us really well to deal with any borrowers who do struggle to return to payments at the end of the hardship arrangement. On, on screen, you can see the original LVR position and on a much more conservative basis, the LVR position based on updated valuations and four months of capitalised interest, which is a proxy for the repayment arrangement that we might enter into with that borrower. So this shows that based on current valuations, over half of our loans that are in hardship have a current LVR of less than 70%. What's more, this overstates likely actual LVRs because it doesn't take into account borrower heads, early hardship completions uh, and the like. So that's reflective of strong collateral support and plenty of margin for safety for our investors, which is, as I've said again and again, is absolutely critical to us. Now, as I've said, we're expecting to see a two to three percentage point uptick uh, and in, from these hardship loans transitioning into longer term arrears. These borrowers will have seen their circumstances change as a result of the COVID-19 economic disruption and our collections team will be working through the implications of that with them on a case by case basis. Now that effect will begin to come through in our statistics over the next month or so. On screen, you can see that are, you can see arrears levels that are still within very normal ranges, but are, that, but, but are starting to reflect an uptick. Now, un, unusually, that's not because of higher levels of defaulting borrowers coming through in our portfolios, including these, uh, these hardship borrowers. Early arrears actually remains at very normal levels. Instead, what we're seeing is the effect of the property market slowdown on the collections processes. In some cases, property markets have closed altogether. So that means that it's, it simply takes longer for lenders, for our collections team to sell the properties that are in possession and work through those more aged arrears cases with our borrowers. That's going to result in an uptick in arrears, particularly these longer term arrears for a few months while our collections team works through the backlog. In terms of shortfalls on the right hand side of the screen, we remain at exceptionally low levels. Last 12 month shortfalls are among the lowest I've seen in my career. And our provisions are very low as well, especially for this time of the year. Now it does tend to take three to six months for provisions to be crystallized. So what you're seeing on screen is a really good leading indicator of fund performance over that period. Assets under management are growing solidly each month for us now. Obviously, that's very pleasing to us to welcome more investors into the Latrobe financial family, but it's also supportive of portfolio diversification. We're in fact back to the assets under management levels we saw immediately prior to the coronavirus and are moving very solidly forward each month. Just as pleasingly, this growth has been concentrated in our longer dated accounts. Now, this continues to improve the credit fund's average investment tenor, which is actually up 8.4% since January. And it's supportive to our overall group liquidity profile. We as a leadership team at Latrobe Financial are very happy with that de-risking dynamic. 
So that's the monthly portfolio report in a nutshell. We're continuing to see the resilience of the fund portfolio in action in the, at the moment, and we're expecting to see that continue in the forward period. But we will now turn to the economic and market outlook in the light, in the light of what is going on with our economies with the coronavirus. And we remain of the view that our economy is transitioning from the hibernation phase to the rebound phase of the coronavirus. So that's the second phase. The length of this transitional period, you know, that just depends purely on the success of our governments in addressing, firstly, the Victorian outbreak, but secondly, any other outbreaks that occur from time to time. Different geographies within Australia will experience the transition at different times. And some places are perhaps already moving towards the third phase, being the restructure phase. Now, this transition continues to see increasing economic activity in the 74% of the Australian economy that is not Victoria. High frequency data like uh, card and spending data continues to suggest that the initial dramatic rebound is tailing off in those places which are rebounding. And of course, that's to be expected. We're moving to a more measured and sustainable trajectory as we move those geographies towards the restructure phase. We expect that economic growth will recover as the year progresses. But as we've said many times before, we don't expect it to get back to pre-coronavirus heights for some time. Lower for longer will be the theme and we'll see lower aggregate demand, lower employment and lower interest rates through this next phase of our economic history. Investors will experience this as a continued challenge in generating consistent real income. On screen, you can see updated projections from most of Australia's key institutions and economists and we'd make two broad points here. Firstly, economists' views are converging. Even the more bearish economists now, they have materially improved their projections since the dark days of early April. Over the last month, Westpac, for example, has improved its outlook both for 2020 GDP and for unemployment. There is, however, a growing realisation that the recovery and restructure phases will take some time to work through. We're likely to see our economy below capacity for some time to come. Watch for the molasses economy, as we're calling it, over the next 12 months or so at least. Our own house views remain unchanged. We're at the bearish end of the spectrum here. It is true there. We're comfortable to be there. In our view, it's a prudent place for a conservative investment manager to sit. We do want to always prepare our portfolios for the potential downside risks ahead. The property market continues to be exceptionally resilient. Now, we've been commenting on this for a number of months, and I think that, the re that, that, that this same realisation now is settling in across the market generally. House prices still declined in August, it's true, but the rate of decline slowed to 0.4%, down from 0.6% in July. That decline slowdown was seen in all capitals except for Melbourne, which was obviously in line with the, we, 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 where in Melbourne we experienced obviously 1.2% uh, decline, which was exactly what occurred in July. Notably of our major markets, Sydney is still up 12.9% year on year. You don't hear that much, but Sydney is still up 12.9% year on year for total returns. Even Melbourne's up 9.5% year on year. So, and, and I can't emphasize this enough, there are still no signs of disorderly house price reductions. This is a very benign outcome so far for one of Australia's most critical markets. The retracements that we're seeing are impacting mostly on the highest value dwellings, and that's as it generally occurs in these sorts of events. And the retracements are, of course, focused geographically on the city that's in government-mandated lockdown, which is, of course, Melbourne. The broader view of the market over longer timeframes shows the same picture. It confirms that conclusion. Excluding Perth and Darwin with their boom-bust exposures to the mining economy, the performance of the Australian market over longer timeframes has been steady and solid. Since 2012, so eight years ago, Australian house prices are up 37%, with Sydney and Melbourne seeing the highest growth at 66 and 50% respectively. So we continue to see short-term challenges for housing markets, uh, particularly stage two lockdowns, which are weighing on the broader market as well as in Victoria itself. In the medium term, there are also challenges with net overseas migration on hold, which is a key demand driver thereby being removed from the market. 
We also see headwinds from longer term credit growth, which we see as, uh, as being low, picking up again on that lower for longer theme. But building approvals are likewise down. So don't forget that the supply side is also likely to be constrained for some time. Net of all of those factors, we maintain our view that an eight to 12% house price correction is the most likely outcome. That will be followed by a short term bounce as economies reopen. And then we'll see longer term solid but unspectacular growth on average across aggregate house prices. I should note that this month, the Commonwealth Bank has improved its own house price prediction from a 10% decline peak to trough to 6%. So that reflects the continued resilience that they're seeing in the property market. And I note, as we always do, that individual regions and sectors will, of course, diverge from the average aggregate outcomes, never be fooled by the, by the famous floor of averages. Okay, so we now turn to the headwinds and tailwinds report in which we point to some of the key factors currently influencing economic outcomes. And as we do each month, we'll focus on some of the enduring themes here, as well as some new and interesting angles and insights. So the first and most obvious headwind is GDP. And there's been lots of coverage of the negative 7% GDP, GDP print for the quarter ending 30 June 2020. The crunch has finally arrived in official statistics, although I do have to say the June, quarters in many way, the June quarter in many ways does seem like it was a lifetime ago. You can see on screen what that means for annual GDP and which GDP components have suffered the most. Unsurprisingly, we've seen household consumption uh, dwelling investment, non-mining business investment being the primary casualties of the coronavirus hibernation phase. This was the quarter that put Australia into the first technical recession we've experienced for over three decades. Remember though, this recession is different to any other that we have had because it is directly attributable to government mandated economic lockdowns rather than the ebbs and flows of the business cycle or the, or the caging of the animal spirits. And that's what makes the outlook so challenging for, for economists generally to read. The next headwind is perhaps more accurately described as a diminishing tailwind. So we're talking about the uh, government support being scaled back. At the end of this month, the first adjustment to the JobKeeper and JobSeeker programs will occur. Eligibility for JobKeeper will actually be widened in some ways, but payments will be reduced and the net effect will be a reduction in government payments to businesses and workers. There will be further adjustments from January, but the impact of those will not be as dramatic as you can see from the Macquarie analysis on screen. Turning to the Victoria effect and the graphs on screen show the impact of stage two lockdowns and, and what they're doing to the 26% of the national economy that we call Victoria. There is no doubt that this impact is also reflecting indirectly in softer confidence and activity in other states. We are an interconnected economy. That's why it's so critical that Victoria moves as quickly as possible back into the rebound phase, not just for Victorians, but certainly for Victorians, but also for the national economy as well. Finally, we keep returning to uh, the point that most of the economic impacts of the coronavirus are being felt in industries overwhelmingly staffed by our younger workers. Now you can see that in the industry segments like hospitality, like arts and recreation, and so on. We do, know, we do not want to end up with a whole generation being lost to our economy. Studies after study shows that extended periods of youth unemployment can have lifelong impacts on the employment and health, out health outcomes of those affected. It's critical that we keep this headwind front of mind. So on that basis, we will now turn to our tailwinds and there is a lot to talk about here. We saw earlier that household consumption was down 12% in the June quarter, but there's been less discussion of the incredible spike in the savings ratio from just over 4% to an incredible 19.8% in the June quarter. And you can see that plainly from the graph on your screen. You perhaps also haven't heard that household deposits increased by 74 billion between March and July. That's an additional 74 billion sitting in low to zero interest accounts. It will be deployed, it will be spent over time. On top of that, Australians have accessed 33 billion from their superannuation funds. Now putting aside the controversies about that particular policy, that is an incredible amount of additional liquidity 
on household balance sheet. In short, Australian households are cashed up to an extraordinary level. Now, this is rational behaviour for households in a crisis, but as economies enter the rebound and restructure phases, there will be highly unusual levels of pent-up demand waiting to be released from our households. This is likely to put a bit of a turbojet under at least the initial stages of the recovery phase. And this liquidity phenomenon also extends to our banks who are sitting on record levels of funding. The big five banks alone saw deposits grow by 145 billion or 8.8% between March and July. Macquarie grew its deposit book by a whopping 18.3% over that period. Now this growth was broad based. It was across the household sector, the financial sector and the corporate sector. And it's transformed the, uh, the, the funding books of many of our largest institutions. What's more, and on top of this, the Reserve Bank's term funding facility is making additional sums in the amount of what could end up being 300 billion, making that amount available to the banks for three years at 0.25% per annum. So certainly our financial system is awash with cash. It will not be facing any liquidity constraints in the foreseeable future. Now, I've been speaking with many corporates over the last three to four months, and one conversation that I've been having again and again has been around the speed of technological adaptation to the enforced work, work, work <laughs> beg your pardon, work from home business model. There is broad agreement that we'd all like to get back to business as usual, uh, to back to business as usual as soon as possible. So make no mistake about that. That is good for everyone's mental health and for the for the synergies and the interconnectedness that occurs in an office environment. But there is also broad agreement that the abilities of our businesses to adapt and to adopt new technologies to facilitate remote working has been remarkable. In some cases, there will be lasting changes to business models as new efficiencies are integrated into old work processes. The graph on the right of your screen shows the uptick in e-commerce market share in the US on the left. You can see a few key online and e-commerce statistics from our own Australia Post. Easter online shopping, for example, was up a whopping 135% year on year. That is just simply incredible growth. There is a potential productivity dividend here that uh, our industries could be banking, and that will be a material medium term tailwind for the economy. The final tailwind is another I keep returning to, and that is the fact that data prints and even subsequent revisions of data prints keep surprising on the upside. Now, this is obviously not a universal law, but it is occurring enough that it's clear that our best economists have consistently been underestimating the resilience of the Australian economy. On screen, you can see a quick survey from select reports from our good friends at Goldman Sachs Research over the last month, and the headlines tell the tale. Declines in Victoria are offset by strength elsewhere, surprise rebounds, smaller than expected contractions. It is a consistent theme in analysts' papers these days, and it is worth noting. Do not underestimate the resilience and creativity of the Australian people, and the resilience in particular of the Australian economy. So to summarise, the main driver of economic outcomes remains the pandemic and the policies put in place to control it. Our base case is unchanged from April. No stage of the recovery will be linear. There will continue to be bumps on the road ahead. As we move into rebound, we will recover some of the economic damage of the hibernation period, but not all of the damage. There will be underlying damage to the economy that is going to take some years to work through. And many of our key metrics like growth, employment, interest rates, they are going to be lower for longer. But the fundamentals of Australia's economy are intact and are strong. On that basis, and in case we've forgotten how well we fared to date, on a relative basis at least, you can see on screen the same chart as I showed last month, but updated for quarter two GDP, GDP figures. And that's something that is made absolutely clear by the graph on screen. Australia's real GDP outcome was among the best of the world in the March quarter when the pandemic first hit, and this resilience has continued into the June quarter. Take a look at the UK, down 20.4%, France down 13%, US down 9.1%. The challenge is how we'll perform in the September quarter, which is, by the way, now nearly ended, and then, of course, the December quarter. Most economists are projecting relatively flat September, small negative to small positive outcomes of the general range. 
for our unemployed and especially our younger Australians, the real risk is stagnation. So that's what our governments and our societies generally need to be incredibly focused on in the forward period. We'll conclude the formal remarks as we always do with a quick survey of the sector and any topical issues that are arising. The first is our corporate financial. As you've heard from Martin, we expect to be profitable and cash flow positive throughout the coronavirus event. With very strong balance sheet, net asset fundamentals, as you've heard, we are not anticipating any rush to capital raising, well positioned to meet any issues arising in the current environment. We've built our businesses, we build our portfolios to be resilient to market volatility in the economic cycle. So the outlook here is stable. Our liquidity fundamentals remain strong. Assets under management are growing month on month. Our short dated accounts remain substantially overweight cash. Tactically, we're shifting to a reinvestment bias in line with prior guidance to investors, but we will continue to monitor market developments very closely and to reserve the right to adapt our strategy here as conditions involved. Specifically, should there ever be a need to increase cash holdings, we will continue to be well positioned to do so. Our commitment is to retain a contingent liquidity plan that provides us with plenty of flexibility and the ability to manage a range of market liquidity outcomes. Our track record is that we have always paid redemptions in full at maturity and we see nothing that will change that. Again, the outlook here is stable. Turning to official cash rate changes and interest rate outlooks, look, our portfolios have been very resilient to official cash rate decreases. This month's adjustments are broadly reflective of what is happening in interest rate markets. So very comfortable with our interest rate settings. The Reserve Bank is operating in the, the official cash rate in at what it is previously described as its effective zero bound, so its lowest rate setting. We don't think further official cash rate cuts are likely in the short term. And our modelling continues to indicate that the current fund rate settings are at broadly sustainable levels given the medium term income port portfolio, uh, profile of the fund. We are taking a look at the moment at the, of the income at our classic notice account in particular, but broadly speaking, we're comfortable with our outlook for uh, interest rates. So a stable outlook is, uh, is the order of the day there. Turning to borrower hardship requests, we are seeing material improvements as we've discussed. These are occurring significantly ahead of our expectations, which is obviously very pleasing. Certainly well inside the stress test scenarios that our portfolio managers were running in March and April, our hardship and collections team will be working very closely with our borrowers to establish a clear path to normal repayments. Indications are that there will be about two to three percentage points of borrowers transitioning to work out. It could be slightly higher, could be slightly lower, depending on a number of variables. We will work sensitively and carefully with these borrowers, but will of course prioritise return of investor capital at all times. That's non-negotiable. Hardship arrangements are themselves subject to responsible lending. They are a bridge through difficult times, not a debt forgiveness program. Uh, arrears levels, as I've said, remain broadly consistent with historical experience across our portfolios. We're anticipating somewhat elevated levels, as I've said, in the more aged brackets over the next few months. And that's because of the delay in taking some mortgagee in possession properties to sale. We'll be watching those numbers carefully, not expecting any undue stress on portfolios there. We're also not seeing elevated levels of early arrears, which is really pleasing. And our collections team are of course well versed in working with borrowers in difficulty and working through market stress. We'll be compassionate to borrowers in difficult circumstances. We will have regard to the unprecedented economic shocks, but ultimately our focus is properly on calling up loans where borrowers' circumstances have changed and they can't meet their obligations. We'll, we'll make no apologies for that. Turning finally to the sector, we see continued strong fundamentals across the system. New lending surged by 18.9% in June on a quarter by quarter basis and 28.9% year on year. APRA noted that this was uh, driven largely by the home builder and first home loan deposit scheme. So that's a, another tick for federal government stimulus packages. We've discussed the term funding facility and the impact that it could have on bank balance sheets. The AOFM, Australian Office for Financial Management, continues to deploy the Structured Finance Support Fund at a slower rate than originally expected. It's deployed 3.45 billion of 15 billion, mostly to support warehouse facilities. It's approved a further three facilities under the forbearance facility mandate. So um, that is just $45.5 million after all. So perhaps that's beginning to reflect the fact that hardship loans are not having the systemic impact 
that some were suggesting a few months ago. Overall, the key point is that the initial period of credit market volatility has subsided. Markets will remain cautious for some time, but they are certainly more settled, and that's reflecting in spreads and volumes across the markets. Our banks are well capitalised, well regulated. The lessons of the GFC, higher capital levels, swift coordinated regulatory intervention, all of that have been learned and implemented well. Broadly, experiences in relation to hardship appear to have been consistent across the industry and well managed. So I did race through that last bit so that I would have some time to address some of the questions that are coming through. So thank you to, thank you to you all for sending questions through. I'll get through the ones that I can now uh, and those that we can't get to, we will follow up with subsequently. So the first question is from Rob and it's about non-performing loans and, and what the outlook is likely to be over the coming period. So I've spoken to that, but let me, let me summarize. It's a very relevant question, obviously, in today's environment. Uh, let me make the following points. I'll use the flagship 12-month term account, perhaps, as the example portfolio. So non-performing loans are at 5.4%. That's slightly higher than normal, but not alarmingly slow. Pleasingly, when we recognise that most of this increase comes from an uptick in our aged arrears buckets, which, which itself has been caused by a slowdown in court processes and property uh, sales, um, it's simply taking us longer to take possession and to sell defaulting properties than it would do normally. We've been pointing to this issue for some months now. We do expect it to continue to have a bit of an effect on those statistics for a few months. Importantly, though, we're not seeing any sustained increase in early arrears at this point. So our 12-month term account has just four basis points of provisions drawn at this stage. So when we think about the outlook for non-performing loans, we return to our earlier discussion about borrowers in hardship. Baseline expectation has been and continues to be around two to three percentage points of borrowers will transition across from hardship arrangements to work out. Now this will occur as some of the longer term arrears loans are worked through, that will mitigate some of the net impact, but it is possible that arrears could end up with say a six handle. So thanks Rob, really great question right on point. Carol has asked about market volatility and the outlook for Latrobe Financial. I think the focus here is on distribution rates. So let me give a little bit more color of the remarks I was making earlier. Our view currently is that our interest rates are about right, plus or minus a little bit. Current projections show that we, that, that you know, in our 12 month term account at 4.5%, we're at about the right level. I do note though, and I remind investors that the return is variable. We review it monthly. It's been very well protected for many years, just four years ago. So September, 2015, the official cash rate was 2%. It's now 0.25%. So that's a drop of 175 basis points or 1.75%. Our te technical benchmark index, the Bloomberg Osborne Bank Bill Index, that's actually fallen by over 2% over that period. So the distribution rate of the 12 month term account by contrast has moved from 5.2 to 4.5 or just 70 basis points or 0.7% over that period, less than half of the benchmark movement. So you can see the account's been very resilient to downwards movements in interest rates. And we've been really pleased to have helped shield investors from the worst of what has occurred in rates market. So look, Say again, the rate's not guaranteed, it's variable across your 12 month investment, but we have a very strong track record of shielding investors from downward rates in uh, downward rates movements, and we're not expecting that to change. Now, Peter, Peter has asked a series of questions. Uh, some are about a reason defaults. I think I've covered that adequately. He's also asked whether our offerings are term deposits. Great question, Peter. So the answer is no, they're not. Latrobe Financial is not a bank. We're not regulated by APRA. Our offerings are not guaranteed. We have no intention or plans to become a bank, as I often say. Banks are, of course, subject to the federal government's bank deposit guarantee scheme. Deposit rates are unsurprisingly extremely low. In fact, they've been consistently lower than the medium term inflation rate for a long period of time. And that, of course, means that investors are actually losing capital value by leaving money in the bank. Our approach, our offering is fundamentally different. We're an investment fund. Our objective is to deliver consistent real monthly income and to prioritize investor capital. So as I said before, none of our portfolios, the classic notice account, 90 day account, 12 month account, four year account have ever lost a cent of capital. Uh, likewise for our institutional investors, never lost a cent of capital. It's a powerful track record, one that we are entirely focused on retaining. Uh, to, to get an insight into our investments, I do encourage you, Peter, to go to our website and review our monthly portfolio report. We summarise these in the webinars, of course, but we have lots and lots of interesting and relevant information there for you to peruse at your leisure. 
Uh, very quickly, Chris has asked if we're considering investments in the US. No, no, Chris, we're comfortable with the fundamentals of our Australian asset class. Its resilience is evidenced by its long-term track record. We're not trying to be all things to all people or, or, or chase growth for growth's sake or anything like that. We know that we can add value to all of our investors by delivering excellence via consistent monthly income, really. So that's the singular purpose that animates everything that we do. Now, there are other questions. I'm sorry, though, we are out of time. I do apologise. We will follow up with you individually after that presentation. But thank you once again for your attendance and interest in our credit fund. It's been our great pleasure to be able to assist you with your investments. And I'll pass now back to Bridget to wrap up. Thank you, Chris, and to Martin Barry and to all of our attendees. Thank you once again for joining us today and for your continued interest in Latrobe Financial. Please stay safe and well, and we look forward to your company at our next monthly investor update in October. If you have any questions we didn't cover today, please contact our investment team on 1800 818 818. On behalf of everyone at Latrobe Financial, we wish you a great month ahead. Thank you.